Good evening and thanks for being with us. I'm Joey Chen. It is still just a series of dotted lines, but the proposed extensions to the Keystone Pipeline are, for many environmental activists, something of a line in the sand. The Keystone XL would ease the flow of oil from the Canadian tar sands down to refineries along the U.S. Gulf Coast. And the pipeline got a boost last week when the State Department released a huge and ultimately neutral report about its potential environmental impact. But at the southern stopping point, the final destination of the pipeline extension, America Tonight correspondent Sarah Hoy found the debate is not about future risks, but over the damage already done. I lost my sister back in 2003. She was just 17. My mother, she was 50, and we lost her back in 2009. And my grandmother, we lost in 2010. Cause of death, cancer. Is there a history of cancer in your family? No, no. All three of these situations, these three losses, were a total shock to the whole family. We have a good history of high blood pressure, but as far as cancer, no. Not like that, no. Former Navy officer Troy Nell Daw was born and raised in Port Arthur, Texas. The small, sleepy city, two hours east of Houston, is surrounded by one of the largest concentrations of oil refineries in North America. Here in the city by the sea, a labyrinth of pipelines defines the skyline, complete with a steady stream of smoke and sulfur-tinged air. It's also here that hundreds of thousands of barrels of crude oil are converted into everything from gasoline to asphalt, to the petrochemicals needed to make plastics. But residents say living in Port Arthur is making them sick. Daw grew up across the fence line from the complex of eight major oil refineries and hazardous waste plants. And he says his family has paid the price. And when you think about that, like you said, your sister, your mother, your grandmother, and you live here in Port Arthur within view of all these refineries, in your heart of hearts, do you think it's connected? I think so. I really feel like... Um... I really feel like a lot of people in Port Arthur, including including my family members that I lost, probably the effects on their health has something to do with these refineries in this area. A lot of people probably walk around here sick and don't even know that they're sick or they might have something ill-fated developing inside of them and don't even know it because we're exposed to these chemicals every day. According to the Texas Department of Health, the cancer rate in Jefferson County which includes Port Arthur, is significantly higher than in the rest of the state, almost 8% higher for men and 6% for women. There's no way to know for sure if Dawes' family members died as a result of pollution, but he says he doesn't need to see any more evidence. His mother's death hit him hardest. That image I still got in my head, like me talking about it now, it's like she was laying there, and they had a, her mouth was open, they had a tube down her throat, and her eyes was wide open, and they was they was giving her charges to her chest. And it I, it was like a, a surreal feeling. The cancer just took completely over. To lose my mother, my sister, and my grandmother like that, it just it messed me up completely. We're being exposed to uh, uh, emissions like benzene, one three butadiene, which are all cancer causing chemicals. Activist Hilton Kelly says he returned to his hometown of Port Arthur almost a decade ago to help his community, which he says is steeped in toxic fumes. I remember standing out here when I was a kid. We used to smell the sulfur odors, the stinky rotten egg odors. We would smell the strange chemicals. And I grew up just thinking that that was the norm. Kelly has become an advocate for West Port Arthur's largely African-American community. We have the disproportionate number of people with cancer in this community to show that and we have people on dialysis at this present time. It, it, it's too many people dying from this. We have a disproportionate number of kids with respiratory problems, bronchitis, asthma, skin disorders, you name it. All five of Chantel Yeoman's children suffer from respiratory problems. The kids are all have bronchitis and allergies. And when I take them to the doctor, they said mainly it's because we're close to the refinery. We're like two maybe three blocks down the street and so like when they release stuff we're more like exposed to it than anybody else so they have to take the butyrol three times a day and allergy medicine at night and how do you feel about living here i was born and raised here so 
I'm concerned and then I'm not. I'm concerned for my kids' sake because the medications they have to take because of the refinery. So, like, maybe in the future I plan to move. Are you kind of used to the smell, used to the sounds, used to the noises coming from the refinery? Honestly, yes. Like, when I come outside and I hit a bell, I'd be like, oh, they released something. And I'd go in the house and close the door back. Yeoman lives within sight of the sprawling Motiva refinery. Last year, the facility nearly doubled its production of oil to 600,000 barrels a day, making it the largest refinery in the United States. When Kelly returned to Port Arthur in 2000, he started his own organization dedicated to improving air quality in the city. His soul food restaurant doubles as a makeshift office. From here, he lobbied the Environmental Protection Agency, and he got their attention. Port Arthur was already on the agency's watch list for unsafe levels of benzene in the air, a known carcinogen. The EPA responded to the community's concerns over their proximity to refineries and selected it as a community in need of help. There's a problem, and that's why we were selected. Only, only 10 communities throughout the whole United States were selected as an EPA showcase community project in 2010. The EPA invested $100,000 in a partnership with the community, local government, and refineries to improve the environment. We're disproportionately being bombarded by this toxic waste from these refineries, chemical plant, coke docks, and incinerated facilities. The low-income African-American community in West Port Arthur. We're being disproportionately ducked on, and we're being disproportionately uh, um, attacked by these toxic fumes. Kelly joined forces with Dr. Petronella Croissant, an environmental epidemiologist, to study the effect the refineries are having on residents in Port Arthur. Although she did find a higher level of asthma in Port Arthur, she says it's difficult to prove that's directly related to the environment. However, she says there is reason for concern. I believe that it's possible that every single com every single component in that complex can be in compliance with air quality emissions, but collectively, if you live in the midst of that, then um, it may not be safe. Oil was first discovered in Texas at the Spindletop oil field near Port Arthur at the turn of the century. The petrochemical industry was what built the state of Texas, which is why Texas is still the powerhouse economically that it is. And it really is rooted in this industry, in this region. By 1923, Port Arthur was home to the largest oil refinery complex in the world. The city was bustling. But historian Sarah Belliard says the people who made their money off the oil business no longer live here. What is different today is that a lot of the old money that was here at the time of Spindletop, that was here in the 20s, Proctor Street was movie theaters and department stores and very fancy, expensive hotels. And now, because of technology, many of the people that work in the high positions in the petroleum industry don't have to live here in order to do their jobs. These days, downtown Port Arthur is a ghost of its former self. The unemployment rate is nearly 16%, more than twice the national average. The signs of economic depression are everywhere. But residents say the town is worth saving. Port Arthur is not a bad place. It's not a bad place to grow up. It's not a bad place actually to live. You know, I love Port Arthur. I do. I want people to know that this area is it's a good community. It's a, Port Arthur is a, it's a nice, it's a small town you can actually raise your family in. Um, but at the same time, be aware, you know, the oil refinery chemical companies around here, you we basically surrounded. We contacted two of the largest refineries, Motiva and Valero. Neither would agree to an on-camera interview, but we did get a statement from an industry association that said in part, air emissions have decreased by 56% over the past 15 years, and episodic emissions are down by over 90%. The statement went on to say that industry had invested hundreds of millions of dollars in air emissions control projects. The EPA's intervention, spurred by local activists like Kelly, has made a difference here. Agency officials told America Tonight preliminary data from last year indicated air quality in the city now meets their standards. 
The industry group said companies had invested several million dollars in the community in the last year, including building a new health center for area residents. I'm hopeful through this new sort of communication between the grassroots organization and industry and local government, this new communication link that has been forged between us, I'm hopeful that that could be used to where we can somehow sit down and agree to a plan to help better protect this community. Port Arthur has a long way to go. Kelly says stronger measures need to be taken in a community in the shadow of one of the world's largest refinery complexes. But he's staying put. Well, I say to a person who would tell me to move, when do we stop moving? When do we stop and turn and fight? These industries are cropping up all over the country, all over the world. So what we're saying to, to the industry is this. Do your job, but do it responsibly. Following up now on the situation in Port Arthur, correspondent Sarah Hoy joins us here. Talk to us a little bit about these people. I mean, they seem quite determined, quite willing to stand up and fight, but do they have a chance? Well, they have small successes along the way. Hilton Kelly, who you just heard from there, I mean... It they are doing little things. You've got the EPA involved. There's studies happening, happening. More people are looking into this. And also we found out that there is a housing development that was near these refineries that has since closed down. The same housing development that Hilton Kelly was born in. Mm. So the industry officials, the locals, they say, listen, the building was dilapidated. That's why we had to close it down. But others, like Hilton, will say, listen, the refineries also had something to do with that. So you were down there yourself, spent a few days down there. Talk to us a little bit about what it was like. I mean, is this something that you could notice right away as an outsider? Absolutely. The second we got out of the car, you could smell that sulfur smell. They refer to it as that rotten egg smell. Also, I had itchy eyes, watery eyes, sneezing, a little tickle in my throat. And at first you thought perhaps maybe it was a cold symptom. But after being there for a week, you had little headaches, things like that. It's hard to ignore when you have all that vapor coming out. So... Was it just a cold, or was it actually Port Arthur? Right, and do we know what the long-term health effects are, and we may not. So, thanks very much, Sarah Hoyer, our America Tonight correspondent, reporting to us here. Do the economic benefits, though, of the Keystone Pipeline outweigh any potential risks? Joined tonight by Ryan Kellogg, an economics professor at the University of Michigan, who has also published some articles on drilling and on Texas oil in particular. I guess it ultimately comes down to